Hello. Hi, can you hear me okay? No. No. Testing, testing, testing. Are we good? Yep, yep. Hello. Let's keep talking then. Okay, well, I might as well just start. Um, is that better? I can hear something. Brilliant. Thanks so much. So um, the first thing I want to say is thank you very much for inviting me to speak here. It's a um, real privilege, honour. Absolutely love the, uh, the venue, Australia, first time in Hobart, etc. Absolutely wonderful. Um, so the outline of this talk is um, going to talk about three things very quickly, give a very brief recap of what are reproducible builds, my kind of story around them, and then um, sort of things that we didn't really want to find out whilst doing this project. So, Sure. Um, uh, yeah, brilliant. Okay, so what is the problem we're trying to solve? So the problem is we aren't trying to solve the problem of reliable or, or repeatable builds. Like people are using the term reproducible builds to mean I can do a build and then I can do it again and it and it still works. You know, it's not uh, it's not reliant on the internet and things like that. Um, so this is this is not what this this problem is solving. So the real problem is whilst we can inspect the the source code of free software, most distributions provide binaries. So you download, you know, you do app get install blah, and it installs a binary. Um, so this is a big problem for security because there's incentives to crack build infrastructure, um, also to try and um, go after developers. So you could, for example, try and um, break into a developer's uh, machine if they upload a piece of software from their uh, own personal laptop, then that, that software could be compromised and things like that. Also, um, individual developers could be blackmailed. So uh, reproducible builds um, prevents developers becoming targets for um, attacks in that area. Um, so the way this works is that um, we ensure that compilation always produces identical results. And by identical, we mean bit for bit identical. Um, multiple parties compare their own builds. So um, I would build it, you would build it, um, someone else would build it, and we all come together and try and form a consensus about what the um, sort of the individual, the, for example, the, the SHA-1 checksum of that should be. And um, therefore, an attack would have to infect everyone simultaneously um, otherwise, um, if, I was, if I was infected, then my build um, checksum would be different and be like, okay, why, why is this? And then we'd jump in and investigate why. Um, yeah. So there, um, apart from those sort of um, security enhancements, um, it's also easier to compare version differences. So if your um, result always, if your build always returns the same result, um, if you then make a change, the only change you should see in the binaries should be the changes that you've intended to make. So um, instead of them being uh, sort of mixed in with other changes and sort of randomization things, um, you can say that, oh, no, no this small patch that we've made um, only changes this small thing. And it gives you more confidence when shipping code from a sort of QA point of view. You also get a, a much higher cache hit ratio if... Um, which is, if you speak to the chaps from Google, they say they've saved quite a bit of money and CO2 simply by uh, making more builds reproducible. Because you just get a better, um, you're just compiling less. You know, do I need to compile this? No, because it's just going to be identical this, the next time we build it. And that's one nice property of reproducible builds. Helps detect corrupted build environments. So if you have something like kind of randomly installed in your own machine, um, if your build is not reproducible, you, you find this out pretty quickly because you get different, um, different results. So, for example, if you're using the wrong uh, GCC because you've um, symlinked something in weird or something like that. Um, also helps with license compliance. So if a vendor um, provides some binaries and a way of... Um, and the source, you can... If you compiled it yourself, if you get the exact same SHA, you know that the binaries that they are distributing correspond to that source. And if you can, if you can uh, rebuild that yourself, that means that they've provided all the source necessary as well. So um, it'd be quite, kind of quite useful for, for, for example, GPL compliance and things like that. Um, so my story um, in here is... Um, uh, I've got a sort of a tech startup background. I was in the, um, the London... Tech startup world for about six years, um, 
always doing free software on the side and things like that. Um, sort of now I'm a freelance programmer and sort of amateur classical musician, that kind of thing. I've been a contributor to Debian for 10 years, um, a user for a little bit longer than that. Um, so I'm, I'm in, that, in that kind of world. But my reproducible st build story, well, it sort of started in a pub. Um, some friends had um, just watched a Fosden video and, um, and I sort of came, I was a little bit late to the party and uh, someone was they were talking about reproducible builds and I was like, oh, what's, what's, what's all this? Um, uh, and they were like, oh, you know, you know when, you, when you build a piece of software and you build it again, you, um, you get a different result. And uh, I sort of, sort of squinted and thought, mm, what, what, why? I don't, I don't really see why, this doesn't make any sense. Like, what, what do you mean you get a different checksum? Like you, you, you obviously, you press up, enter, you, you rerun, make, you get the same result. Why would it be any different? And the, the whole idea sort of offended me that this was not the case. Um, like, perhaps this is some sort of OCD thing. Um, but um, I sort of went home and, you know, did some compilation of some packages of mine. And, oh, yeah, when you, you didn't change anything, but when you built them, you got different an actual different file at the end. This was actually like, personally offensive to me for some reason. I don't know why. I mean, it's just me. Um, and I sent my first patch um, to make a Debian package reproducible in to the 23rd of January of, uh, well, yeah, it's almost two years ago now. So, yeah, um, I've since sent seven, over 700 patches to various um, upstreams and with inside Debian, things like that. Um, a lot, lot of them on leaf packages, so making individual packages now reproducible. Um, but also I'm trying to work a bit more on tool chains, because you can obviously, if there's a, um, uh, a piece of software that's making tens of packages unreproducible, it's, easy, it's much better to work on that and much more rewarding and things like that. But these individual changes, they're sort of like mini sort of crossword puzzles. So each one perhaps takes sort of like 20 minutes or so, and it's kind of a good brain teaser. And they're really great bite-sized chunks of kind of mental work, which is kind of fun. So um, you also have a sort of predetermined endpoint. So you're like, oh, this, this package is not reproducible. Um, and you sort of try and work out why and then apply it. And then you get it reproducible. Yes, you've got a patch. And it usually takes, as I say, sort of 20 minutes, 30 minutes to sort of work out what's going on and send the patch, you know, make sure everything's fine. And it's kind of quite a satisfying and... Um, there's a sort of endorphin rush there, and again, it sort of drives uh, this sort of uh, momentum and OCD and things like that. So, yeah. So that's probably why I've sent so many because it's been a bit, a little bit addictive in that sense. But I've seen a lot of other changes as well. So we've gone from um, being something like 29% reproducible in Debian to we're currently 93% reproducible. Um, the green that you can see is um, the reproducible packages. The reason the graph get sort of bigger is because more packages are being added to Debian as we go along. So it's sort of a moving target in that sense, but uh, it's pretty, pretty good. And some of these blips you see are where we've perhaps screwed something up or we've changed slightly how we vary and test our definitions. So yeah. um, It's not just a Debian project. I really want to stress that. Um, one thing in the last two years is that we've made a big conscious effort to include other distributions. Um, they were already very interested in the project and there were a lot of work already being done. But now we try and do as much stuff under the umbrella of reproducibilebuilds.org. So nothing um, Debian specific. And this is a little bit challenging because we've got a, quite a bit of Debian infrastructure there, like using the mailing lists. And um, yeah, we could move elsewhere, but you know, it sort of already works and things like that. Um, and we, we don't, certainly don't want to put anyone off contributing because they think it's, oh, this is a, a, a Debian thing. So you've got all sorts of um, completely varied projects, um, including BSDs and things like that. So it's not, not even just the Linux, Linux uh, sort of a, a thing in the Linux domain, should I say. Um, I've also been working on um, a tool called Diffiscope, which is, um, which is should, probably should be much uh, better well known. It's sort of, um, we like to call it a diff on steroids. So whilst diff um, will normally take two files uh, and just compare the differences in quite a blunt way, Diffiscope will recursively unpack those two files and try and work out semantic human differences. So for example, if you give it two ISO files, instead of just giving you a, uh, that are different, 
instead of giving you the uh, byte for byte differences between them, which would be kind of useless, it will look inside them and say, ah, oh, no, there's actually a SQLite file inside here, and um, for example, and with different um, contents, and it will, um, for example, you see at the top that, um, that oh yeah, someone's used um, an insert command with a different different values. So you can very quickly go from um, uh, the actual change and be like, oh okay, why is this? Um, you can. If, you, if the package was unreproducible because of this, you could probably work out, oh, right, you can probably search the, uh, the original source code for git underscore commit and find out. And this, this is completely recursive as well. So if the ISO file contained a, a tar file, which contained a deb file, which contained a, uh, a PDF, and in that PDF was an embedded ping, and in that embedded ping was a, a comment, it would, um, it would be able to display that to you and display it in a nice semantic manner in a, in a human readable as well. You can try it out at uh, try.diffiscope.org. It's a service I set up. You can up just upload two random files, and it'll try and give you the differences between them. So that's a web-based version of this software being run in um, sort of a isolated-ish Docker sort of setup. So it's a good way of, um, of um, experimenting with Diffiscope. And this is useful for um, not only in reproducible builds, but also in, in releasing software. So you want to release a bug fix. Um, and you only want to make sure the changes um, that you've made are in the binary that you are about to distribute, you can just throw it into Diffiscope and say, oh, look, yes, these, only this line has changed. So it's, it's very, makes you much more confident in shipping that software. Um, subsequent to that, we've also been um, uh, very generously um, been awarded grants for, by, from the Linux Foundation, specifically their core infrastructure initiative, which was set up after the Heartbleed SSL vulnerability. Um, and so um, I, I'm very honored to be, um, to be given a grant to work, um, to work on reproducible builds from, um, from the Linux Foundation. So thank you to them. So yeah, abandon hope, all you enter here. So when we, uh, during the reproducible builds project, you come across a lot of source code and things like that. And a lot of, quite a few things that make us sort of, you know, quite a few WTF moments um, and things like that. So I'm going to just run through some of them and hopefully it will pique your interest enough to um, jump in and perhaps get involved with a reproducible builds project. Before we get on to that, just want to, I'll need to quickly um, talk about our Debian's testing framework. So what we do is have a reproducibility torture test. So here we have, um, we build each package in Debian twice. Um, one after the other, with as many variations between them as possible. So we change the time, the time zone, locale, file system, um, CPU, um, basically anything we can possibly change and vary between them, um, we do. So you know, different shell and things like that. And this is to expose as many differences between the two builds as possible. Um, and um, so that's the, the testing framework. So that's some of the things I'm showing. So yeah, there's this long history of um, interesting bugs that are slightly WTF. So this is quite famous one of can't print on Tuesdays. Um, and this is actually a bug in file. It's quite an interesting bug to um, look into. Um, the case of the 500 mile email, um, which is another interesting one to Google. And uh, lesser well known that um, you, I think it was PDF TK, they, uh, this, this gentleman couldn't concatenate PDFs between the months of April and December. Um, Anyone guess why? Um, the underlying reason was that the, um, the Austrian, German, Austrian uh, locale he was using, the months contained um, an accent character, which was breaking it. But yeah, these kind of like white moments, I think. So anyway, n yeah. So some interesting things we found. Um, when doing reproducible builds, we, as it shows up variations between builds, it will, um, show up like randomly generated things. So for example, um, this particular piece of software during the build, it um, generated a secret for OpenID, uh, which is based on a sort of, um, it uses some sort of uh, random secret key. And uh, it shoves it into a file that gets installed to use a share Perl. Um, you know, it's, it's random, it's fine. But it means that every installation of gbrowse, I've given the name away, um, shares the same secret. Now I'm no OpenID expert, but I'm guessing this weakens the security somewhat if everyone shares the same secret. 
And it's a little bit misleading as well, because if you look to the source code, you're like, oh, it's, it's, it's randomly generated. But um, um, because this gets done at build time, and everyone is going to be installing that binary package to their machine, everyone's going to share that same secret. So that's in GBrowse. So it's a bit worrying. Um, this is another interesting one, random chance. So um, doc book to man, for some reason, we'd some, sometimes see randomly, uh, we see random capital I letters instead of tabs. Like, what, what is going on? Like, um, it turned out that um, they were using memcopy, which, um, and um, at the top of the memcopy man page, it says that the memory regions shouldn't overlap, and um, these are going to overlap. And um, so if they contained um, N and then the null character, it would, yeah, and it eventually maps to, yeah. So you just use mem, mem move instead and things like that. But um, you look at the, the diffoscope output between these packages and you, you're just scratching your head saying, why, why capital I? I just, just don't understand, like, what, what is going on? So, filed in .book to man there. Um, you also get some interesting um, tests. So we run all test suites. Um, so this package here, um, it was, I think it's, this is some sort of um, table-based software. It times how long it takes to do 1,000, then 10,000, and then, you know, it, it, the algorithm should be linear time, so, you know, it, fine, okay. But on a um, kind of overloaded build box, this isn't necessarily the case. So, you know, it will fail non-deterministically. Um, yeah, so don't use wall clock time to test for algorithm complexity, pretty obvious. But um, yeah, and you get some interesting pushback from upstream because they say, you know, well, it works for me on my machine when I'm not doing anything else. So, yeah, I guess so. But not really getting the idea of unit tests and determinism. So yeah, you can look that one up. Uh, this is an interesting one, um, using random number, numbers in builds. So um, u there is a function that basically gen, um, generates a random string. So, yeah, we were finding that this package uh, actually failed to build, you know, half a percent of the time. And this is because, um, well, I mean, just random, so you can, the list would differ. So most of the time, it would um, be absolutely fine and it would be generating random numbers rather nicely. But then 0.46% of the time, it would generate um, a long string that only contained the A and B characters, and that would not match the right-hand side of the assertion. And if you do a bit of maths, that turns out to be 0.46%. So yeah, um, yeah, it's kind of interesting. Um, non oh, this, this is a fantastic one. So we were finding that um, non-deterministically, um, packages would be installed with a shebang of user bin Python or user bin Python 3.5. Like, why? I don't understand. Just scratching your head, just like, it just makes absolutely no sense. And you put, um, it was one turning into one of these Heisen bugs where you put debug statements in, and uh, then it, it suddenly wouldn't work. And then you would be able to reliably re reproduce it, and, and you, then you wouldn't. And then you just sort of scratch your head and go away and come back, and you're like, well, why? No, it's really bugging you. And th this, one, th this one really got, got to me because I got really stubborn about it. But um, long story short, um, Debian's Python helper rewrites the shebang support. Um, so after building, it says, well, I'm building the Python 2 version, so I'm going to put a Python 2 shebang in. Or I'm going to definitely put a Python 3 shebang in. And um, but if the build takes, if the build of the Python package takes less than a second, um, distutils, the Python thing, doesn't think the file has changed because it has a one second resolution. And therefore, the file does not get copied over to the target build directory. So yeah, um, so yeah, so I mean, it sort of you know it sort of makes sense, but to find that out was just you know because I was it wasn't helping that I was putting sleep statements into the code as well, or or breaking out into the debugger. It's like but but it will just but when I continue it will be installed. So what? Just, um, yeah. Anyway, that's now fixed. Um, yeah, so that's, that's pretty good. Build from source in an hour. So yeah, you also see some rather um, humorous things in source code. Um, for example, this is a game. A little joke for the programmers. If you built it from source less than an hour ago, you get a million bonus points. So this is a game. And um, if you did actually um, build at is defined in another in a config header. 
So if you built it less than an hour ago and you got the same UID, um, you, you start this function returns true and you get a million bonus points to start with. I don't know why. It's not particularly funny and it doesn't actually work on Debian because your UID is the, here, is the um, UID of the, um, the builder, which is root, because that's how, what the builders run as on the thing. So it doesn't even work. So it's just like, oh, brilliant. Okay, so fix that one. Um, Polygen is quite an interesting piece of software. So um, it's a tool that uses um, a, a sort of grammar-based thing for generating random text. So you can use it for um, generating thank you notes, um, and you specify it as a context-free grammar, and it'll sort of um, randomly choose the words. So for example, polygen is a what is, and then what is defined as um, a powerful program, and you see how it comes as a tree. And because the, the author is, or polygen itself is quite humorous, um, polygen's man page is obviously generated via polygen, which is great. Unfortunately, this means that every time you make um, the package, you get a different man page, which means the package is not reproducible. <laughs> Very good. Um, the fix for this is, um, luckily, Polygen can take a random, um, you can specify the seed. And uh, we export an environment variable called source date epoch, um, which um, is currently set to the, um, the latest entry in the Debian changelog file. So if we just set polygen C to be that file, you at least get, for every new version of polygen, it gets a new man page. But each individual version, if you recompile it, you get the same one, so the package is reproducible. So yeah, yeah. so it's pretty fun. Um, apt, apt itself is a, um, has non-reducible output. So has everyone seen apt moo? Oh, yeah. It's a bit, of a, a bit of an Easter egg. Um, unfortunately, on the output, depending on special days. I won't give it away which days it is. I mean, it's in the source code. But um, yeah, on, on certain days, you get different, uh, different cows. So yeah, it's kind of funny. Um, that's now been, as of today, that's in the apt um, repository. So apt is now fully reproducible, for ready for the next uh, release. So we're all happy to hear that. And there's a whole slew of other ones as well. I mean, some epic fails as well. I mean. The, the, the torture test, as I say, uses different time zones and locales. So a scary number of, um, uh, I think it's particularly Ruby, um, time zone libraries and date parsing libraries don't actually, um, all their test suites fail if you run them in, I'm going to say extreme time zones, but for example, UTC plus 13, which I think New Zealand is in right now, daylight service time. Yeah, they, they fail when you really run in um, uh, that time zone, so you know. You had one job, guys, to be a reliable library, to be a, to sort my times out so I don't have to worry about them. But no, 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 no. Yeah, so pr pretty scary, pretty scary stuff. So yeah. So getting involved. I mean, hopefully um, you can kind of a little bit of humour involved in that, and just kind of made you slightly interested in um, getting involved in reproducible builds. So as I say, it's not just Debian. Um, so a lot of this has come out of Debian, but um, it really isn't, um, um, and. Um, so please don't be put off by that. Visit our, our Reproducible Builds website um, and join Ash Reproducible Builds on OFTC. We have IRC meetings, also pretty sociable, and things like that. So please come and join us or just look and, um, and see what the status is and things like that. Um, anyway, thanks very much. If you've got any questions about Reproducible Builds in general, um, again, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to speak here and uh, thanks for uh, Linux Foundation for their grant, etc. things like that. So, if there's any questions about the status of... Yeah. Thank you. Well. Uh, you said in the Debian Torture Test you rebuild twice. Mm. Why not three times, a hundred times? Why, why is twice good enough? Um, so we... Um, is this back on? Hello? It sounds like it's off. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay, fine. Um, we, we build twice, just as a comparison between two. We are constantly rebuilding the archive. So um, whilst we only are building two, um, between two different things at once, um, that package will get rebuilt perhaps once every two weeks and things like that. Um, there are slight plans to introduce perhaps third variations 
But, so we could have an A, B, and a C build. But, but for now, we can introduce enough variation just between two. So things like that. Yeah. 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 Uh, thank you for the talk and your work with reproducible builds. Uh, as you put up one of the slides, I realized uh, that I actually have one of those random Python test bugs in the package I used to contribute to. Oh, yeah. Um, which, is not, yeah which is not maintained anymore. Uh, the, 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 that impact is maintained, but the upstream is sort of um, left to falter. How, how, are, how are you feedbacking things to other Debian packages, and what should upstream, particularly ones that don't have much of a maintainer anymore, be doing to try and make sure they're reproducible? I, I don't know if I could have find the time to go close those. So I, I, know, I know what they probably are. Um, would you want me to go file a bug in the Debian bug tracker just to point them out? Like, what, like what are you looking for with regard to that? Um, it m might depend on the specifics here, but um, typically our process is to um, uh, try and send at least get the patch into the Debian bug tracker to start with, so at least there's a, a location that we can link to, um, because upstream may not have their own bug tracker. But yes, we'd pref much prefer all these things to be upstreamed, um, and we link them and upstream them as much as possible. Um, we're doing even more of that. Um, with the Linux Foundation grant, I can spend more time getting these things upstream and you know, responding to the upstream saying, oh, I don't understand what this is about, or I, 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 don't, I, I don't care. You, know, you can spend more time trying to convince them. But um, yeah, I mean, if they're upstream, then, then everyone benefits and things like that. Yeah, so. But I mean, if you do have unreducible, unreproducible things, then uh, maybe you should, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it shouldn't take too long to fix, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. I've been working uh, whoa, loud. I've been working adjacent to this area for many years. I used to have a project I used to have a project called Aboriginal Linux created this yeah. It created the smallest uh, development environment capable of rebuilding itself, under, rebuilding itself under itself from source code. I got it done to seven packages. And that was to reduce dependencies and to track what the dependencies actually were, because sometimes there's a dependency on a dependency on a dependency, you know, stuff that has to be in the path that's not listed as an explicit dependency because we didn't link against its library or stuff. The other thing I was doing, oh, and I was, I was testing the builds against, you know, the glibc version versus the busybox versions that I was writing, and now I'm doing one called Toybox. The other thing was I was cross-building on a bunch of different architectures and comparing the behavior between those. I had automated builds running under QEMU, and then I was testing that it behaves the same way on, you know, x86, on ARM, on PowerPC, and so on. Your reproducible builds infrastructure is there any work to try to trim down, you know, the number of dependencies on packages to, to simplify any of this stuff, to, to make the scope of what you're trying to do more easy? Or you're, or you're just basically going, I get the same output, and that is the scope of the whole project? That's currently the scope of the project. Um, to, uh, there's no current work to try and minimize dependencies if we just get the same um, if we get the same output, then we're sort of happy with that. Um, and similarity across architectures is also out of scope. Similarity across architectures is out of scope. We do find it very interesting, though, um, when packages you do get, if you are, they, sorry, we do find it interesting and do track and can track in our database when the checksums are different across architectures. Um, but most of the time, they are the same. Um, yeah. Have, um, um, and that would show up some very interesting things. Um, and but we also see some variations between CPU type as well. So even on the same um, architecture, like on the same Debian architecture, say AMD64, if you use a different CPU, you may get different optimizations and things like that. So these are all uh, more variations we want to add and try and um, resurface. But to speak to your original question, no, we not 
not focusing on minimizing dependencies. Um, I'm not sure that would bring us much value or wouldn't bring much value to Debian because they were not trying to be extremely minimal in that sense. I'm guessing that was why you were... Um, Yes, uh, very much so, and some unresolved questions as well. I mean, um, the big one is um, Emacs. So um, um, I forgot the name of it, but um, you, it builds a quite a large VM image, um, um, which is not, which isn't actually reproducible in itself. Um, and so every time you rebuild that, it uses profile guide optimization and um, things like that. So yeah. You, we do have some problems in that sense. And one solution is to bump that to first run or first boot. But if you were, that doesn't make much sense because this takes sort of 30 seconds, 60 seconds to, to run. And uh, yeah, yeah. And profile guide optimization is, is actually is pretty good. So to, to lose that would be a, would, would be a shame. Um, so yeah, we do run into problems, yeah. Um, are you looking for reproducible just binaries, or are you also trying to get the build output and the test output to be reproducible? Uh, just the binaries, um, because that's basically what Debian are distributing. So that's sort of our sort of um, unit of reproducibility. You know, are the binaries the same? In, uh, although speaking to that, sometimes the uh, upstreams like to include the build logs in the binaries which is kind of interesting if they have timestamps in them or they, um, they include the test suite output, which is kind of useful, kind of. Um, but if they're running the test suite in parallel, then the, uh, the, uh, the output will be non-reproducible in that sense. So it's sort of difficult, difficult to know where to draw the line and, and things like that. Yeah. And how do you, what's your standard thing you start saying to uh, maintainers like Sam that have traditionally included build path, host name, time, in a helpful debug message? Um, the time, we can usually point them towards the source date epoch. Um, and that has a um, specification, which has quite a good rationale for why including the, the time, the current time of day, is kind of useless. Mm -hmm. um, we can understand why you might want to include some kind of time. Um, and that's why, but that's why defining it. So for example, using the last um, time the last timestamp from Git, for example, is probably more appropriate and more, in, and, and more useful as well, more auditab auditable as well, because you can go from that time right back to the Git commit. Um, but yeah, a lot of the time it's just pe people include them because that's what you did. I mean, you used to just put it in your um, usage message that this was built on host name blah, you know, and it is just kind of useless. And when you point out to the maintainers, they're like, oh yeah, it's just kind of vanity, isn't it? Really? And um, because everything's built on um, build networks like Fedora, Build Farm, and things like that, the host name is completely meaningless. It's just some sort of Amazon node. So who cares? So, so it's easier today. Yeah. Uh, any more questions? No? Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask you to thank Chris for a fantastic talk. Thank you. Thanks so much.